Hey, welcome to the, uh, the last session of the day. I've enjoyed the previous ones. I hope you have too. Uh, I'm Mark Gritter. You can uh, reach me on Twitter at Mark Gritter. I'm going to be talking about graph grammars. So what's a graph grammar? Here, here's one, and you can play with it online at soffit.combinatorium.com. Apologize for the hard to remember domain name. Uh, it's, it's a rule that applies to graphs. So on the left-hand side, we've got something we want to match, so a node named leaf. And on the right-hand side is the production, what we're going to do with it. So in this example, we're creating a binary tree by replacing a leaf by another node, and we can do it again and again and again. And um, this is, a you know, uh, like a, a uh, context-free grammar that operates on strings, but it's operating on graphs instead. So more formally, a graph grammar or a graph rewriting system is a set of production rules for labeled graphs. We can relabel the nodes. We can add components. We can delete them or merge nodes. So what is this useful for? Uh, graph grammars can be a syntax for a visual language, just like context-free grammars provide the syntax for textual languages like C++ or, or Python. So here's an example that's a grammar for process flow diagrams. How do you parse a, a, a process flow diagram? What are its components? How, do, you know, how does it fit together? Uh, here's an example of that uses graph transformations to edit UML diagrams. The graph grammar that Dr. Herman uses here is, in his PhD thesis is somewhat more complicated. It has negative acceptance criteria, features that shouldn't be present, as well as a match on the graph and a, a transformation to make to it. Even textual computer code can be understand as an can be understood as an abstract syntax tree, which is a type of graph or as a term graph. And here's the image from Hops, a system for working with term graphs that provides the capabilities to transform and visualize code. And I'd be lying if I said I understood everything that was, was going on here. Many graph grammars allow non-deterministic execution. Any rule that matches can be applied. So they're an interesting model for concurrent or randomized execution. Shown here is an example production rule that's part of the sheep, sheep, wolf, cabbage problem. The side of things I'm most excited about is uh, the ability to create graphs and other content that can be represented as graphs. So here's an example of rules to produce a semantic network. Molecules can be represented as graphs, so chemical reactions can be modeled by graph transformations. So uh, here's an example of, of doing that on the right, and it's a syntax that I find kind of verbose. This is one of the examples of things I didn't want to do in making my own language, but uh, you, there's a link here to the library. Uh, one recent use of graph grammars is in the game Unexplored, Joris Dorman's published work on creating missions and spaces with graph grammars, then applied it in the design of the game. He didn't publish directly on Unexplored, but the YouTube video from ProcJam is very good. A more recent effort along these lines is the Twitter bot Tiny, Tiny Peril, which creates adventure-like graphs. Ian Holmes wrote a small JavaScript graph grammar engine that's the basis of, the, of this work. He also made use of Tracery to generate the, the sort of title about what was going on here. So great, how do I get started uh, using graph grammars? I was very interested in you know, how can I make projects using this? And there are several very good implementations of graph grammars, but unfortunately I hated all of them. Uh, a lot of them are very large integrated environments like, like uh, Progress, which got a lot of u academic use, or they're big libraries with very complicated syntax, you know, to, to sort of, uh, you know, they're, they're sort of, you know, the prototypical examples are huge Java libraries created by very obsessed Germans. 
Um, and it was hard to imagine that I would ever be able to embed one of those in a small generative art project, particularly when I want to put online, like like Meta Artbot. I was able to embed tracery in the web page there and not build a lot of supporting infrastructure. And that was really my inspiration here is, is this language by Kate Compton called tracery uh, that I talked about at Minibar last year. Um, and so I picked the name Soffit. Uh, down in the right hand side, you can see a, a soffit. It's an, uh, also an architectural term. So here's a brief introduction to soffit. I already knew Graphis's dot language. So graphs and soffit are written in, in sort of like dot syntax. So here's the name of a node. Um, you know, here's a tag that we associate with that node. Here's a directed edge. And edges can have tags as well. Following Tracery's design, and I'll get into maybe this wasn't the best idea, graph grammars in Soffit are JSON objects. So the left-hand side is the key, and the right-hand side is the value or a list of values, each of which could be used. So here's a simple Soffit grammar that generates a random graph with five vertices. It starts out with the complete graph described here in the start tag. All the edges marked with question marks, then the rule is take an edge with a question mark and either keep it or remove it. So pretty simple. I like that this is very compact. Uh, there are a few additions to the dot syntax. One is that edges can be chained together. That's not valid in dot, but it's it again helped make compact representations, or they can be written in the opposite direction for clarity. Uh, the caret character standing for join specifies that two vertices should be merged together on the right hand side of a rule um, and like swift that was another one of my inspirations nearly any unicode character is a valid identifier and because i'm using graph is as the background for visualization uh, any attributes that appear as a tag are just rendered instead of quoted as a label so Soffit is a non-deterministic language. Uh, it operates by first shuffling all the rules. Then it tries each rule in this random order. So if you have multiple right-hand sides, shuffle them too. And then if there's a valid match, pick randomly from all the valid matches within the target graph, up to about 1,000, so we don't spend a lot of time enumerating possibilities. So Soffit is implemented in Python. There's the GitHub link. It comes with a couple sort of crude command line tools. We could execute a graph grammar or a sequence of them and plot the results as in a scalable vector graphics. We can show a rule set as an HTML page. I built an online version later with AWS Lambda, and I wanted to just switch over to that very briefly. You know, here's the example. We see the rule set with each rule illustrated. Uh, there's our starting graph, and we can uh, run for 10 iterations. It takes a little bit to get started because it has to reload the, the Lambda. And so you can see we got a binary tree, and I used the, the capabilities I was talking about to color in the internal nodes brown and the, the leaf nodes green. So, you know, the good news is I was successful at using Soffit in other projects. I built a system called Emoji Economy that builds toy economies and, and trade routes. And I talked about it at this year's roguelike celebration last Saturday. You can find that video is online as part of the this live stream, or it'll be separate on YouTube soon, real soon. Um, I'm working on an extension to Soffit that produces uh, SVG output directly and shown here, creating some small robots. And as a stunt, I tried to use Soffit to solve advent of code problems last year. And I did manage to solve a few, but very slowly because the graphs get large. And you know, my implementation's not all that super efficient. Although I did manage to improve it in the con in in doing that. So um I am Soffit's primary user, and I'm also its big, biggest critic. I, I'm, uh, I know all the mistakes I made. I wanted to share that right now. I was trying to build a little language. I didn't really succeed. Um, one of the biggest mistakes is using JSON, because JSON kind of sucks. 
there's no ability to make comments, at least with the standard parser that I was using. Some some parsers have extensions that you let you make comments. Uh, there's constant comma problems. Uh, you know, if you're doing a lot of copying and pasting, it's really hard to make sure that the last rule in the file does not have a comma and every other rule does. It's not possible to embed a new line. And this makes it very difficult to write large rules because it sort of wraps around. Um, hey, now, I didn't end up writing the implementation in JavaScript anyway. So one of the biggest benefits is, oh, it could just be inline and some JavaScript code went away. Also, there's no way to name rules for debugging. Uh, so you know, the, the output has to be either the entire graph or you know, just what matched. And it's, it's, it doesn't really work very well. Um, Another thing that other tools do better is left, the left and right hand side of a production usually share a lot. And other tools have a separate context section instead of just copying all the graphs, the, the parts that don't change on both sides of the production. And uh, similarly, I don't have any templating facilities. So these end up with dozens of versions of the same rule. Uh, that with only minor modifications. So here are examples from my advent of code solutions. So one technique I used that, that is illustrated in, in these two is sort of have the left and right hand side on separate lines and have them aligned so I can easily see, okay, everything's the same, except, oh, okay, we, we added something. Um, but think of like having eight more rules like this that only, are different in you know what's the tag we're matching here. I got I sort of worked around comments by having a rule that would never match because it has this long tag that is unique. Um, you can see you know these rules here get extremely hairy, and being able to break them up into separate lines would help. Uh, some things I did, I'm less clear are mistakes, although they are signs that my language didn't really meet its design goal. I like Python, but in terms of, of you know, uh, could other people use this in their project, it would be better to have something that's more embeddable. Uh, it's still sort of too big to say, okay, pull in a Python interpreter, although if you're building your game in Python, that's fine. Uh, but Lua might be a better choice, or maybe JavaScript, or maybe even C Sharp, so people could use it in Unity. Uh, Soffit ensures that each node on the left-hand side matches distinct nodes in the graph. It's an injective mapping for, for, math, called for mathematical reasons. That's the name. Uh, because I thought that would be simpler to understand. Uh, but then I discovered cases where I actually wanted that. Like if you're going to parse symbols and have only one version of each, suddenly injectivity means you can't match the pair AA because you've only got one A. Um, Tracery has ports to every language you can think of. Would it really be feasible to do this with Soffit? Not as it currently stands. I made heavy use of a Python library called NetworkX, which is great, it has a lot of graph algorithms and a lot of capabilities for working with graphs. And I used a Python constraint solver. Um, it would really be hard to port. Uh, there was an online question, where do grammars fit in Chomsky's hierarchy? They are Turing complete. In fact, I will, thanks for the question. I will actually show an example because I have that. Uh, Hold up. So here is a Soffit grammar that implements a Busy Beaver Turing machine. So it's the Busy Beaver with uh, four states. So you can see, you know, we've got a head, state, a pointer to the tape. We run that. You know, some rules to extend the the the, the tape on either side with blank when we need to. So. Um, you know, there's the Turing machine doing its thing. So graph grammars are Turing complete. Um, so I wanted to talk about category theory. Uh, the mathematical foundations of, of graph rewriting are either, are usually expressed either 
with double pushouts or single pushouts. And you know, before we get into what those means, it's really just what are the semantics when you are deleting things is the is the only difference between these. Um, so say you've got a rule like this this one here, where you're going to match a pair of nodes with an edge between them and then delete node B and the edge leading to it. So what double pushout semantics say is that um, you, you can't leave a dangling edge with such a production. So here's an example that should match, except we've got this other edge in purple from B to C. It says we can't apply that transformation because it would sort of implicitly delete uh, the edge C as well, or just leave it dangling with no source node, and that's not possible. So we can't apply the rule in this situation. And similarly, we can't have a node that's simultaneously dead and, and alive. And this only occurs with non-injective matching. So a potential match for this rule is both A and B map to the same node, that this is both A and it's B, and it's got an edge between edge between the two the the node in itself so it matches the rule but the production says leave a alive and delete b so we can't do both so again in double push out it just says this is not a match for this production rule and there are other options for semantics that you know i don't understand and for ways to formalize it that i haven't really got into all these but basically the big difference between the two common formats you'll see in the libraries is how do they deal with these situations. OK, so very short introduction to category theory. We've got about 10 minutes left. A category is just a collection of dots and arrows. They're called objects and morphisms. And they have some very simple rules. So basically, every pair of head to tail arrows can be joined to create a new arrow. So x and y can be combined to create a new arrow called y composed with x. This rule is associative, so if you have x, y, and z, you can do x, y first, or you can do y, z first, and you, and you get the same answer either way. And every dot has an identity arrow, where if you compose x and 1, you get x back. So the category of graphs, the objects are graphs, and the morphisms are the arrows are uh, a function between two graphs, a, a mapping between two graphs. So it's the green arrows here, where we map node A in the source graph to node M in the second graph. We map to B to N. And so this, this edge has to map to this edge. So this is not a function between arbitrary graphs. It's just a set of mapping between two particular graphs. And we can think of a directed graph as it's a set of vertices, a set of edges, and a pair of functions start an edge mapping edges to vertices. And the condition for a graph morph morphism is it has to map vertices to vertices, edges to edges, so that the start and end in each of the graphs match up. And this can be expressed as a commutative diagram, which just says any two ways of combining the arrows are equal. So if we, if we uh, take this path, and we take this path, then we have to end up in the, in the same node. So the what's the push out in double or single push out? A push out is an object that in category theory te terms has a universal property. So we can think of it as a machine where we the black it, uh, elements are inputs is these two pairs of morphisms F and G. And the output is a special object P and morphisms I and J that make this a commutative square. That just like in the previous example, if we take the right-hand path or the down path, we get to the same place. Um, the special property is that if, the, if we have any other commutative square, like ABCQ instead of ABCP, then there's a unique morphism from P to Q that makes everything in this diagram commute. And what that means intuitively is P is sort of the smallest P that works. Any, any other thing that works, we can sort of in, embed P, P into Q in just one way. So in, in set, we can 
think of push outs as sort of a disjoint union plus. So the, the push out of ABC, you know, push out takes everything in C and everything in B, but anything that originally came from A gets merged back together. So, you know, we have to map we start out with an element in A that's in C and in B, then the morphisms from B to P and C to P have to take that to the same element. So in graphs, it works the same way. The pushout is the minimal graph that contains an image of all of B, contains all of C, but it merges the image of A in both graphs. So in the upper right-hand side where we don't have any edges, you know, if we take a node like uh, this one has got mapped over to this in C, and it got mapped to this in B. So those two have to map to the same element in P. If you look at this example, you can see it sort of looks like a graph grammar production, and we can actually read it either way. So I'm going to read it with B being the target and C being the rule. So this is a rule that says take any three nodes and construct uh, the complete graph on five nodes making them. So the mapping here is non-injective. One and two actually end up in the same node. And you know three maps to three. And then we've got some extra stuff in our target graph. So the extra stuff has to be preserved. We still have to have this blue node with an edge to three. And we're going to add all the stuff from C in. But because one and two got merged together, you know, there's no way to unmerge them. So this edge between them becomes a self loop. So that's sort of what a push out looks like. A double push out is we we paste two of these together. So the our rule in a double push out is composed of two morphisms. There's the left hand side the right-hand side, and then the middle K is the left-hand side, but with the elements deleted. So K to L is an injective map. G is the input graph, the graph we're trying to apply the rule to. And this push-out, we're actually operating in reverse. You know, you can see the arrows go from K to L and K to D. So the push-out is, is a line, is mirror flip from the one we were looking at before. Instead of running the machine on L, K, and D and getting G, we're, we're running the machine backwards on L, K, and G and trying to find a D that works. And then once we find that D, then we you know, apply all the additions of new elements in R to get our final graph H. So that's you know, a very brief overview of the mathematical background between, behind what is a double push-up. And you know, you can build this construction exactly in the case where the rules I talked about, about what you're allowed to do with dangling or half, you know, ambiguous situations holds. So this math works out exactly when those rules about ambiguous situations applies. So thanks for attending. Uh, you can try Soffit online. I've been meaning to link some examples, but for now you can find them in my gists. You can check out the source code on GitHub. These slides are available also on GitHub. Uh, you can reach out to me on, on Twitter at Mark Gritter. In real life, I work for HashiCorp on the Vault product, and HashiCorp is hiring. So uh, you can reach out to me about that as well.